Welcome, everybody, to a wonderful episode of Sled Bash with NWAC and Thunderstruck Films. This is a unique episode, a little different than we traditionally would do on our Sunday nights. Um, we're actually, for the first time ever, that's one thing I love about the amazing platform that we have here, is whether it be industry announcements like we've done earlier this season, um, you know, business announcements with different folks, but uh, tonight we're going to try a new format, something really exciting, is basically an opportunity to highlight highlight with you and introduce you to a avalanche center here in the Pacific Northwest. We have the Northwest Avalanche Center, and we also then have Thunderstruck Films. Clay Hockle is on, as well as uh, Levi. So as everybody starts to come in, what I'd love to have you do is just drop it in the comments. Let us know where you're watching from. So far, I see we've got Ian McNichol on, Tia Smith is on, Kevin Carell. And do me a favor, folks. We're going to have an amazing share and win contest going on. And with this contest, anybody who shares this episode tonight, Mr. Clay, wave Clay, tell everybody hi. So Clay... Clay has put up six copies of the new Thunderstruck 19 film that's available right now and upcoming, depending on the platform you're looking at it on. And so anybody who's, who shares this out is eligible to win one of six copies of the Thunderstruck film tonight. So, you know, get to work. Let us know where you're watching from. We're going to talk a lot about, uh, you know, just reading the forecast, understanding the forecast, how to apply the forecast. As a pro writers, you know, what they're doing to, uh, you know, plan and prepare for their day. Uh, we're going to go in and talk a little bit tonight also about an amazing opportunity in the co the comment section or the notes section of the show. Things you guys should be looking for is there's web links in there for our Sled Bash raffle. So we have a Sled Bash raffle there tonight that you can click on either now or anytime after the show within the next week. We're going to be giving away amazing prizes. So some of those prizes were listed out in my pre-show teaser that we had. Um, we've got avalanche bags, we've got beacons, we've got copies of the Thunderstruck film available there as well. So you can click into there. We've also got the uh, Northwest Avalanche Center website link in there. The Thunderstruck website link is in there as well along with Thunderstruck Adventures. So an amazing action-packed, fun-filled topics tonight. And so as we get people around in, we've got a lot of viewers coming in. We're up to about 40 live viewers now. Keep sharing it out, folks. We're going to get this rolling. So now that we've got people rolling in, let me tee it up and uh, bring us to Mr. Scott Shell from the Northwest Avalanche Center. How are you doing, sir? I'm doing great, John. Thanks for, uh, thanks for hosting. It's good to be here. Yeah, no, it's, uh, it's such an amazing opportunity finally to have you on. I know you and I work together sort of kind of i guess you can call yeah. it work it's too much fun but uh those who oh, may yeah. not may, may not may not know is uh i'm actually on the volunteer side of the northwest avalanche center i'm the current vice president on the board of directors and i get to work monthly in meetings on things like fundraising the dni committee as well as just the general board meetings with scott and i've known scott now for geez i guess it's probably been three or four years we've gotten to know each other and at least got, four john I know. It's just time flies when you're having fun. I kind of yeah. forget forget how it goes. But uh, Scott, why don't you just give us a, a, just a quick rundown of, you know, kind of Scott Shell, you know, a little bit about you personally as far as, uh, you know, your time at the Avalanche Center. And then let's talk a little bit high level about, you know, maybe somebody doesn't know, you know, what is the Northwest Avalanche Center? Where is it located? What areas do you guys cover? Kind of just some high level bullets of the Avalanche Center and yourself. Yeah, um, so I'm the executive director of the uh, nonprofit arm of the Northwest Avalanche Center. Uh, the Northwest Avalanche Center, we serve uh, the Washington Cascades, Washington Olympics, and the Mount Hood area of Oregon. Um, and then we, uh, just like many of the other avalanche centers across the uh, West and over in New England, you know, we issue a, a danger rating. Um, and we're, we're about to start doing that. You know, the snow's flying. Uh, a few of the other, I think Utah and Colorado, uh, those forecast centers are already issuing daily forecasts. So we, uh, once we get enough snow, we'll start doing that. Um, but yeah, I've been with, uh, NWAC for, um, gosh, I think it's 10, either 10 or 11 years. Nice. Um, yeah, I got hired originally as the, uh, education coordinator and, uh, started that for a couple of years and then became the program director. And then uh, I took over the reins of the nonprofit um, for five years ago. So yeah, this is season five for uh, for the executive director role. Well, I guess uh, that, and it's awesome. 
I guess that means that's probably close to about as long as I've been with the Avalanche Center now that I've uh, caught up on the math because uh, you were starting yeah. about the year that I was uh, starting on the board as well. So Yeah, exactly. I think that's right. Yeah, I think you had just joined the board and I had just been hired as the ED. So Very good. So, yeah. Well, and, uh, well, go ahead. I was going to say they haven't run you or I out of town yet. And so uh, <laughs> we seem to be holding the wheels on the wagon so far. So nice, I nice mean, job on I keeping mean, it going. Definitely got a limb <laughs> on each wheel, you know, <laughs> but hey. <laughs> absolutely. Absolutely. So thanks Scott for that introduction and kind of the high level of the Avalanche Center. So Clay, let's uh, move to you next. Uh, just so everybody knows, Scott's over here to my side. Clay, just so you know, you're above me, so I'm going to point up at you, buddy, and say, <laughs> Clay, Clay, it's all about you right now. Let's talk a little bit about you know, who you are, you know, how you kind of got pulled into this thing called Thunderstruck Films. And then let's talk a little bit about your current role at Thunderstruck and, you know, kind of a, just real high level, kind of the vision for where we're going with Thunderstruck. And then we'll jump over to uh, Levi in a minute. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, happy to be here. So Clay Hochul, Thunderstruck Films, um, grew up kind of, you know, riding with the Thunderstruck Films crew once a year, um, got real close with them, uh, you know, really good friends. And then from there, just kind of escalated as I wanted to become a better rider, you know, pushing my own abilities. Thunderstruck kind of recognized that, and I actually got invited on the team about five years ago. So I, I rode for Thunderstruck for, you know, four full seasons. And then last year, Jim Phelan started chatting with me. He saw some of the direction that I wanted to go just within the industry with uh, an adventure style setup. And he said, you know, this would be a great opportunity for Thunderstruck to keep its name, keep doing a great movie, and then, you know, expand into what you're doing uh, instead of trying to launch out on your own and, and growing it, you know, as a Thunderstruck rider, maybe, you know, look at growing it uh, as the owner of Thunderstruck. So that created a great opportunity for me to take over the reins on, on Thunderstruck films and then shortly after uh, launch Thunderstruck Adventures as well. That's awesome. And I don't know if Scott and or Clay, you guys have figured this out yet, but I've, I couldn't decide who I wanted to represent tonight. So I decided to represent both. I've got the Thunderstruck hat on. <laughs> I've got the NWAC shirt on, and of course, a little bit of John Farine love in the background. I got my Live Large, uh, you know, wall hanging here behind me. So we got it all covered tonight. We got it all covered. I like it. I figured I like you would, it. John. Oh yeah, you know, you know me. I'm all about a little bit of marketing for you, for Clay. I like to get everybody, everybody out there. Like, just give everybody a little <laughs> bit of love. So Levi, let's talk about you a little bit. Uh, you're one of the pro writers on the, especially the new Thunderstruck film. I I just had a chance to watch it the other night, and I got to see your segment. So I uh, appreciate yeah. you being here. But give us a little bit of background about you personally, kind of where you live, that kind of thing, and then how you got tied into Thunderstruck, how long ago, and kind of where you're going with it. Uh, yeah, my name is Levi Johnson uh, from Logan, Utah. Uh, I got involved with Thunderstruck. Well, because of Shad Simmons, okay. uh, he hit me up and had a bunch of jumps built, and so we uh, went and hit him. <laughs> very cool, very cool. So uh, we'll uh, come back around to you a little bit uh, later in the show as well, too. Um, the first thing I want to talk to you folks about, too, is, you know, we, we hit it on at the beginning of the show, but I can't, uh, you know, kind of mention it enough here is that, you know, this is a really unique opportunity. I've never done this as part of the show and partnering with the Avalanche Center. We've set up an opportunity to, you know, Clay, you've provided some prizes for this raffle. Scott, the partners, Scott, do you happen to have, I don't want to put you on the spot here if you don't have it, but uh, do you happen to have just a quick list of some of the sponsors that have supported the prize list? If not, I can help you with it. I think I got some of them memorized, so. Yeah, well, I mean, I think the the big one that we've got is uh, Clem's Enum Claw Power Sports. So those, yeah. those guys kicked in a uh, three hundred dollars service voucher that you can use to uh, to tune, repair whatever your sled or well anything that they repair. <laughs> yep. uh, so those guys uh, they they kicked in that, and then uh, I think I you know I don't have it, the list in front of me. Oh, it's okay. Um, I can. I, I was snooping myself too. I couldn't resist. I had to click on yeah. the link and see what was in there. And so I may not hit all of them. So if there's anybody we missed, we apologize for it. But I get, you know, Clay, for sure, you've got some copies of the Thunderstruck 19 DVD in there. Um, we've got BCA threw down and got a, uh, you know, I know these are partnerships that Scott, you had established with the Avalanche Center is, you know, BCA's provided a um, Mountain Pro Avi Vest. Like that's mm -hmm. a 800 plus almost thousand dollar Abbey Vest by the time you add an air canister and everything in there. Um, you know, that's an amazing prize that's available. 
the uh, BCA Link radios. There's two BCA Link radios and they're available. I know Ortovox had thrown in a beacon, if not one or two beacons. There's a um, BCA shovel in there. Uh, like I said, I was snooping earlier. I couldn't resist. There yeah. was too, too much good stuff in there. But, uh, you know, I would just tell you there's a lot of great things in there um, for everybody to kind of bid on. And the cool part is, you know, as we're doing the show, you can do it, you know, and click out and then click back in. Or you can do it after the show. The link will be available for a week. Scott, can you confirm that for me? Is it through the end of next Sunday or through the end of Saturday? Do we have a cutoff on that link? We'll do it. We'll do it for full seven days. We'll do it through the end of next uh, next Sunday. So end of day, Sunday, you know, and then Monday morning, what we'll do is we'll get that sorted out and uh, we'll we'll figure out how we're going to draw the winners. Uh, Scott, your website, your software does that automatically, doesn't it? Doesn't it have kind of all the automated stuff in there? Yeah, gone are the days of um, pitchers of beer and uh, rolls of <laughs> raffle tickets, at least in the COVID area. Yeah, it's it's all done. Uh, it's all done uh, via computers these days. That's awesome. And then the other thing I want to do a shout out here for too is that, uh, you know, we're going to talk in depth about this, but want to encourage anybody, especially if you live here in the, the Pacific Northwest, whether it be Northern Oregon, you know, they ride the Cascade Mountains, you know, to become a member of the Avalanche Center. And we're going to go into some detail a little bit later here in the show of why it's such an important thing to support your local Avalanche Center and to help draw some funding towards the Avalanche Center. And all of those raffle prizes and all that money we're going to raise tonight on this show over the next week as we share this out. And guys, and it's, you know, you're going to get in there. You're going to be able to buy some tickets. You're going to be able to share it with some friends and share the love out there. But all that money is going to come back to the Northwest Avalanche Center for this episode and uh, help raise money. So, Scott, I mean, why don't we talk a little bit um, about, you know, when people fund the Avalanche Center and what's going on there you know, what, where does that money go? Like, what is it being invested into? Is it, you know, is it websites? Is it training? Is it, you know, weather stations? I mean, don't go too deep, but like high level, what are some of the things that are the Avalanche Center and the funding goes to um, if people are joining as a member? Yeah, I mean, you, you, you kind of, you kind of nailed it there, John. I mean, it, you know, the bulk of what it goes towards is, um, you know, is, is covering staff time. Okay. Uh, so there's a fair amount of money that goes towards staff. And then, of course, website. Um, you know, the, the primary way that we're communicating what it is we do, you know, whether that be a, a forecast or weather station, you know, the weather station data that we have, uh, that's all done via, you know, the internet these days. So having a really functional website that's, that's easy to navigate is, is important. And this year, in fact, our website, um, we fully launched a brand new website this year. It's all of about uh, 10 days old. Um, you know, and that's, that's getting pretty darn close to a six figure investment this year. Uh, so we spend a lot of money on, on websites. Um, and then of course, education, you know, we offer last year, we conducted 300 free avalanche programs throughout the Northwest educating, I think it was close to 11,000 individuals. Wow. And, uh, when you're contributing to an avalanche center, you're helping uh, us fund those education programs. And in essence, you're helping, um, you know, provide avalanche education to either yourself or your community members. Uh, so we spend a fair amount on education. Um, yeah, so, um, you know, weather stations, uh, staff and forecasting time, uh, professional observations, websites, and those sort of things. Very nice. Very nice. So, uh, you know, that's the cool part I love about, you know, and Scott, I know you're familiar with it. And I think Clay and Levi, you guys have heard about this too. But, uh, you know, my whole show and everything I'm about is, you know, this avalanche education, snowball safety and all that. But kind of I, what I love about the money that we invest into these nonprofits, whether it be the Avalanche Center, whether it be Airy or, you know, all these different folks around the country is all of that money is then you know, basically you're just investing in yourself, right? Like as a snowmobiler myself, if I invest in my avalanche center, basically I'm investing now in the tools that I as a snowmobiler in riding the backcountry have access to and can use. And so, you know, maybe why don't we pause for a minute and I'll shift back up to, uh, you know, Clay, maybe why don't you go here first is, you know, as a, as a pro backcountry rider, whether you're, um, you know, riding, you know, in the film or not in the film, you know, tell us about how you leverage your local avalanche center where you're at and, you know, checking the forecast, getting out there as, as well too. So talk us through like how it is that you leverage the local avalanche centers in your riding areas. Yeah. You know, really encouraging other riders to use it along with us, you know, trying to set the example of, Hey, here's how we're utilizing it by, you know, taking into effect where we're going to go ride for that day. You know, what the probability 
of the conditions are on the train that we're riding. Um, and then, you know, trying to share that with our other fellow riders on how we can, you know, work together, get that knowledge out there. Um, you know, Thunderstruck is huge on, on the fund right, fund raising side of things. So, you know, rather we're doing a premiere and, and raising money that way, or even just, you know, sending a box of DVDs and swag to a local club or a local Abbey center that's putting it on that we don't even show up to. Um, you know, we, we try to have a presence anywhere we can. And if we've got a couple of riders in the area, you know, we'll try to send them down to that event, stir it up a little bit, you know, get people excited to come watch the new film and, and you know, raise money for the Abbey Center. And then as the season kicks off, you know, just keeping the momentum going with, you know, bringing up things in our Facebook posts, you know, checking the forecast, putting out little videos, you know, help our sponsors, Backcountry Access and, and Climb have been, you know, huge for Thunderstruck. Um, you know, they share a very aligned, you know, where they want to go uh, with the industry and the awareness on avalanche side stuff there. So the more that we can, you know, work with our sponsors and, and the industry to, you know, just have that knowledge come to everyone's phone, computer, whatever it is that they're checking before they go ride. That's, that's yeah. our goal. Yeah, no, that's awesome. And Levy, I'm going to shift over to you for a minute too, as you know, on a, on okay. a typical, typical ride as you go out, um, you know, I can only assume that, uh, you know, riding with Clay and those guys, you guys at some point in the morning as you go out are referring to your avalanche forecast for the day. Can you time to talk us through a little bit about the, the dynamic of a, a group ride that day and kind of that discussion leading into a ride and how you guys leverage that forecast? Yeah. So typically, uh, I'll get the forecast while I'm driving up or driving, you know, to get gas or whatever. Super easy. It only takes a couple minutes. I got a website and a phone, you know, a hotline you can call. Uh, once I'm riding, uh, I've been known to kind of like guilt, tri guilt trip people about the, the forecast. Like, hey, you know, did you catch the forecast this morning? And, you know, people are always not that happy when, when they haven't got it. So. <laughs> Uh, I'm pretty big on it. Uh, it helps a lot. Yeah. And, uh, yeah. Yeah, sounds good. So, Scott, I'm going to come back down to you now. And what I want to do is talk about something. And, and just so everybody knows, anytime we do an episode or a show like that, you know, we end up having, you know, kind of pre show discussions. And the funny part is, you know, Scott and Clay and I were on a three way call the other day. And we virtually kind of talked through almost the entire show live in the thing. And the cool part is, is the reason that happens is because we're such a passionate group of people who are so excited about these topics and just live and breathe them every day to the point where it's like, man, like let's get in that conversation. And, you know, it doesn't matter who, you know, if you're talking to friends about football or whatever, but like when you all got to combine passion, it's easy to just get into this discussion. And so Scott, the, the topic that we kind of aligned on, you know, ahead of the show was the idea of, you know, the snowmobile community, checking the forecast and what you typically are kind of getting the vibe on and like you know are, are they looking at it and are they understanding it are they using it are they checking it at all you know are they looking at a color code are they going deeper like I, this is such an amazing topic and i really would encourage anybody who's watching the show to really listen in and tune in because this is going to be a really part of the dis important part of the discussion and you owe it to all of your friends to hear this same discussion so one more shout out and call out Please share out the show right now. We'd love to have you guys share this live here as we're going. We still got a lot of great content to cover tonight. Again, this will be available post tonight, and you'll be able to click in all these links and stuff too. But uh, Scott, as everybody's taking some time to go ahead and share that out, why don't you bring us into this idea of you know the snowmobile community and what they should be doing and how they should be reading the forecast, and and is it being overly simplified or are they really understanding <laughs> it? You know, and so let's just dive into that. So it's all well, you, buddy. It's it's a you. Uh, <laughs> I mean, it's a challenging question to like to to really give you some some solid meat on, or or um, you know, we don't have a lot of of precise uh, information or data on exactly how people are using the products. I mean, there there was a um, a pretty extensive survey that went out uh, a year ago that is that that I think is starting to elude how people are using. Um, avalanche forecasts in their day out yeah. um you know i guess but you know ba backing up i think i think this conversation that you that we were having the three of us the other day was uh you had asked me what what would the one thing that i'd want to there you go to, to communicate out to everyone and i think um 
you know, the one thing that I'd, I'd love to have every sledder do would be to check the forecast every day that you're going to go riding. In a perfect world, you'd be checking the avalanche forecast seven days a week, even on yeah. your work day, so that you can keep your finger on the pulse about what the heck's going on in the mountains. I mean, it's different if you live in the mountains and you can just look out your window, but many of us don't live in the place that we're riding, and True. so we need to rely on other sorts of tools to be able to figure out what the picture is up there in the mountains. And an avalanche forecast center is a wonderful place to do that. So in a perfect world, those who are riding an avalanche train, once the winter starts, you're checking your local avalanche center every day and keeping your finger on the pulse. And then the day before or the morning of the day that you're heading out, you're doing a deeper dive into the forecast. Uh, and by that, I mean, one, one of my, um, you know, just anecdotal observations that I've had is that I've seen a lot of snowmobilers go to the forecast and click on it and look at the color and put the phone in their pocket. So and let's pause, like, let's pause that for a second. Yeah, yeah, let's, yeah, yeah. yeah let's, tell, let's just analyze that for a minute, right? Because this is no lie. Like I ride with people every single weekend. You know, Scott's been on a snowmobiler, you know, on a snowmobile out with me for sure. So I know he's, he's connected to the community because he's like tied into guys like me and what's going on. But I can tell you like day in and day out, every weekend I'm out riding, I'm riding with anywhere from a couple of people to like 20 people, right? Yeah. And what yeah. you just said describes way too often exactly what i've observed like levi how about you is that you know when you're out in the snow park with random people like oh yeah the, the avalanche forecast what is it oh it's green today oh, like oh it's, it's you green. know we're good yeah like that's that's that thing and we're all shaking our head clay you've seen the same thing right and so you know obviously that you know from somebody who's gone through and i, I think you know levi and clay you guys have been through avalanche training as well as like once you've gone through you know starting with the awareness class and then to like some kind of a basics class, whether it be on the snow as like a companion rescue. But for sure, once you've gotten into a level one, an airy class, a level one class, and then of course there's level two classes available. But once you've gotten into that level of training, you realize really quickly how, you know, I'm going to use the word, this is me being the bad cop here, guys, is, you know, <laughs> it's, it's ignorant, right? It's very ignorant. And the word ignorant stands for just don't know any better. That's my Minnesota slang, right? It's like, you just don't know any different, right? And so your friends have told you it's green, it's yellow, it's red or whatever it is. And, you know, but what I find with someone who reads the avalanche forecast that way, if it's a red day, guess what? A lot of them just stay home because they don't understand it. They just think it's like, oh, it's too dangerous. I can't go out. And where I look at it and I go like, okay, now I know where I'm not going today. Right. And that's something I think we want to dive into a little bit, too, is talking, Scott, about, you know, where to go versus where not to go and the way different users will view that kind of, you know, way to approach the avalanche forecast. So why don't you kind of dive back into that a little bit? Well, yeah, I mean, I think, you know, when and, and I'm, you know, I'm sure Levi and Clay could could would second this, but you know, when they, when you see red or black, when you're dealing with high and extreme, it's pretty unlikely you're going an avalanche train. <laughs> exactly. I mean, uh, I mean, hell, if it's, if it's, in, if it's extreme, you're probably not going to be able, at least in Washington, you're unlikely going to be able to even drive. There. <laughs> so, um, it's very true you know, here. <laughs> I think, I think it's not, you know, we, and we don't, for that very reason, you know, there's a lot of really good, um, uh, like weather warning systems that are in place that when we forecast high or an avalanche warning, the message gets out. And even those who aren't all that avi savvy know that when it's a, f a flashing red banner that, well, maybe I should, you know, come up with doing something else today. Maybe I'll, I'll work in the shop or whatever. And so, you know, th those are pretty, I, I think, self-explanatory. The, the trick with with this is when when it's, you know, green, yellow and orange, you know, low, moderate, considerable ratings. And, um, you know, we see, uh, you know, I, I think it's around 80 percent of avalanche fatalities in, occur in moderate and considerable. About 30 some odd percent are in are in moderate danger and about 50 percent are in considerable and, um, you know, the considerable dangerous avalanche conditions, Yeah. you know, uh, you know, human triggered avalanches are likely in considerable danger rating. So, you know, it's, it's, I think it's really important that we all understand that the forecast is a starting point. 
Amen. The forecast is a starting point to your day out and that you control your own risk. And you basically do that by choosing when, where, and how you ride your sled. And you're doing that by like choosing your terrain, basically. You're either going there or you're going there, or maybe you could also say, I'm not going to go there, I'm going to go there. Yeah. Uh, and, and yeah, one of the things I think we were chatting about in that call when we had the other day was, you know, one of the things I've been, um, I've been saying for quite a while is to, you know, try to act more like a professional when you're, you know, there's a lot that recreationists who maybe you go out and you ride, you know, maybe you ride five days a year, maybe you're more of an avid rider and you, you're fortunate enough to get out, you know, once a week uh, on the weekend or even maybe a Saturday, Sunday, and that, you know, totals whatever that is, 20 or 30 or 40 days of riding. But if you take a look at what professionals do, and I mean prof snow professionals, people that, you know, you know, uh, manage and control their risk um, or do it for work or take other people out. One of the kind of central themes with professionals is that they always think about where they're not going to go. Yeah. So and, you know, as, and, and another way to think about it as the danger rating goes up. There are less places that you can go to avoid triggering an avalanche. Yeah. And so what a really good way to, to kind of shift your mindset is to identify terrain that you're going to avoid. And so and that's where the, the simple fact that the color that that process only works when you maybe see red or black. Yeah. which basically tells you don't go or don't go on avalanche yeah. terrain. Yeah. Maybe just go ride in the meadow. And But as soon as it's like green, yellow, and orange, it's really important to take a deeper dive in the forecast. You, you know, read the bottom line and then step down to see what the forecaster wrote that day as to what the, you know, the snowpack, it depends on where you live, but whether it's called a forecast discussion, a snowpack discussion, but take the time to read those paragraphs because that will paint a much clearer picture as to the terrain that you should be avoiding. Uh, and then there's things called avalanche problems, which is um, just a system that we use to kind of explain um, the different types of avalanche phenomena, where in terrain we expect to be triggering avalanches and how, how uh, easy they are to, uh, to trigger. So avalanche problems is just another kind of tool that is a deeper dive from the, the, the danger rating. Yeah, no, and I know one thing that came up in our discussion the other day too was the idea that, uh, and, you, and you maybe touched on it briefly, but I'd like to go a little deeper on it, is that idea that, you know, whether it be a moderate or a considerable day, you know, that yellow and red color coding, it isn't that there isn't a possibility of like a, you know, a massive catastrophic avalanche that's going to take someone out. What it is, is that the percentage of the terrain gets smaller and smaller and smaller. That becomes that extreme danger. Right. And so, you know, on a green day, you can trigger an avalanche in really extreme terrain, whether it be yeah. the right angle, maybe the right condition, maybe a persistent weak layer, wind slabs, wind loading, like all those different problems that you're analyzing. And that's why if you stay connected with that forecast on a daily basis and you really understand what's going on, not just that headline, you know, it's like reading the news, like literally, would you, you would you buy the Seattle Times or any other magazine, you know, newspaper around the thing and, and literally just read the cover or the, the headline of the article and not read anymore? Like, it's the yeah, same how thing. Often, how often does that get you in trouble? You read the oh, headline. Yeah. I think you know what you're talking about. And yeah, yeah. Like, oh, and, no, and that's, that's actually saying. <laughs> And and that's exactly why the deaths are reflected at such a high number at low level avalanche danger. You know, that that's the problem is like you guys are saying, green light doesn't mean go, go, go. And I think that is where like we're getting at here is a lot of the issue with just checking the forecast, not reading the headlight, you know. Don't look at it like a stoplight chart. It's it's not a it, yeah. you know, the advisory is great for the color, you know, it helps put it in perspective real quick for you, you know, get a quick dial in at what's going on. But yeah, don't just read the headline. Don't look at it like a stoplight chart because when you look at it like a stoplight chart, that is more dangerous than almost not looking at it at all. Because if you look at it and it's green or it's yellow, oh, good, we are good to go, boys. Let's go ride. Let's have fun. You put it away, you're good to go. You know, it's almost like yeah, you, you you're 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 more. It's more dangerous to go and have that mindset looking at a green and and yellow forecast than it is to go ride red. You know, 
when you're riding red and everyone's scared and looking around and you're being careful, people are more safe. And the statistics say that because people aren't dying on those days like they are on the the, the, the safe days. So that, that was kind of where our conversation was going. I think that's something good to try to, you know, relay onto our viewers now is that it's more dangerous to be out riding in safe conditions than it is in dangerous conditions St- well, statistically speaking. <laughs> yeah, st- statistically speaking, you're absolutely right. Because right. what what happens is people let their guard down, right? It's like, yep. you know, you're more yep. likely to tackle that extreme terrain if you feel like the avalanche risk is lower, right? And I think it's just that yep. human nature. It's it's like, you know, think about it this way. It's like it's like going through an intersection where there's stoplights and the light's green. Like, guess what? If you got a green light, in theory, statistically, you should be able to make it through just fine. Does that mean that you don't look left and you don't look right to make sure not someone's about ready to blow a stop sign or there's an emergency vehicle coming, right? If you drive the way you do in the avalanche train, that's what's going to happen. You just, oh, green light, I'm going to go, right? Mm-hmm. But, guess, but guess what? You're going to get T-boned and killed at one point because guess what? Not everybody stops at the red light, <laughs> you know? Exactly. It, it's yeah. just statistically speaking, your odds are pretty good if you go, and go through green lights, but you still need to be aware of what's going on and pay attention, right? Yeah, it's a good exactly. analogy, John. I never thought about it like that. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it's interesting too, you know, I've, I've ridden a lot of motorcycles over the years and it's, it's the difference in like, you know, rolling through a green, you know, a stale green light in a car versus rolling through a stale green oh, yeah. light in a motorcycle. That's very different. Yeah. Yeah. You <laughs> got your, you got your head on a swivel when you're on your bike, I bet. Right. Yeah, totally. <laughs> nope. Absolutely. Yeah. You know, one of the other things maybe on the, on the, just the danger rating color sort of thing is, um, you know, with, especially with like moderate, you know, I think moderate considerable, I see riders, um, generally thinking a little bit more um, or, or maybe interpreting the forecast and even maybe having discussions, but definitely that yellow moderate, um, you know, I, I oftentimes have been out with people who just assume that's also just a, you know, a hall pass to, to eat up terrain. Like, you know, there's no problem, but you know, one thing I'd like to just kind of leave people with on, on the, on the moderate side is that, you know, there is likely, some place in the terrain that you should be avoiding. Yeah. So if if you if you check your avalanche center's forecast that morning and you see yellow, yellow should mean caution. There is some place in that terrain that you may be able to trigger an avalanche. So figure out what that is. Absolutely. Don't just stop there at the color read down and figure out what it is that your forecaster is thinking is the hazard yeah. and where it may be and have that conversation with your partners that maybe it makes sense to ride, you know, ride that. And it could be as simple as, you know, you know, 40 degree slopes, 40 degree north facing slopes near ridgeline. You know, it could be a pretty narrow piece of terrain that that, that that forecaster is assuming that avalanches might be able to start. It might be a much broader picture. It might be... Yeah you know, all slopes on the north or whatever. So, but just yeah. take the time and actually read through and then have a conversation about what it is that you'd like to avoid. Yep. Nope. Absolutely. And so, uh, you know, I know <laughs> just, you know, the exposure I've had to avalanche education and training and, you know, I can, I can safe to say that, you know, the minimum expectations everybody has, obviously you check the forecast, you get out there, but let's start talking about safety equipment a little bit, right? I think, you know, the, the bare bones, like absolute bare bones and Levi, after I get through these three, I'm going to throw it up to you next and see if you have some other suggestions on top of this. So kind of pay attention here quick because we've got, you know, the avalanche transceiver known as a beacon to many people, right? You have an avalanche transceiver, and you got to know how to use it, how to switch it from, you know, transmit over to search. Uh, an avalanche probe, which, frankly, I know a lot of folks who have a probe in their backpack that have never pulled it out and used it and understand even what it's for. They're like, well, I got it. I guess that works. But getting the training, we're going to get into that in a minute, too, the training. But then a shovel, right? Like, if you don't have a shovel, a good quality shovel to dig with, and a probe, and a beacon and understand with training how to use it, like you have no business in the backcountry at all. Like that's that's frankly what it comes down to. And there's other equipment on top of that. And I'm gonna shift it up to you, Levi, because I'm sure there's other things that you guys have, you know, that you use in addition to that. And so why don't you talk us through some additional ideas of equipment that people can use? All right. So first off, uh, if somebody if, if somebody doesn't have the basics like what you just said, uh, I just don't ride with them. I mean Fair enough. I just, uh, I just say, okay, well, have fun. You know, <laughs> not riding with you, but uh, on top of the Abbey gear, uh, 
I carry a Garmin. It's like kind of like a spot. Yeah. And I've had to use it before. Uh, you know, not, I don't, I don't like to use it, but, uh, <laughs> it definitely was nice to have. Yeah. And I think on top of that, I would say probably like a, an emergency blanket. Okay. I had a, I had a situation where a guy, one of my, one of the guys I was riding with actually broke his femur and oh, wow. he was, you know, passing in and out and, uh, was kind of green and not making any sense and got really, really cold. And, but, uh, so luckily I have my, my blanket and built a fire and yep. got him go. Absolutely. And then Clay, up to you too. I'm sure there's at least a couple of more items on your list that you have that we haven't already mentioned. Feel free to chime in. Yeah. You know, I like to carry a little toolkit. You never know what those tools can be used for. Um, yep. You know, your standard first aid kit, you know, just a, I, there are a lot of little things here and there, you know, for situations where, hey, you need to get fuel out of a sled. Hey, you need to cut this branch, use this as a splinter for a guy's leg, um, you know, parachute cord. Um, you know, first aid stuff, a little, little bit of everything, some stuff that can, you know, work for two or three things, you know, the more you can make it compact and, and fit easier, the, the better it's going to be one on your back. If you're carrying a backpack or, or two, you know, on, on your sled, um, you know, a lot of discussion we can get into on what should be doubled up, you know, one on your sled, one on your backpack, shovel, stuff like that. Um, but yeah, the quality of the stuff that you're using really, you know, don't, don't go cheap on the shovel. I mean, I think that's my biggest takeaway is if yeah. anyone's ever seen an avalanche or, or been in an avalanche, you know, that stuff is, it's concrete. It is, it is rock hard. Yeah. You know, guys will be buried six inches, 12 inches deep and they'll die because they just can't push through that concrete layer. Yeah. So it's not like you're in a powder field where you're, you know, digging your sled out and you're used to your twenty dollar you know home depot shovel <laughs> that you got on sale for a special yep. you know spend, spend spend the money you know get your nice backcountry you know access dozer shield you know so you can cut that layer you can use it you know you can splinter a guy's leg with it. i mean there's value in having the right tools when you need the right tools because Absolutely. when you need them you you're, you're going to be you're going to be willing to pay anything for that piece yeah. of equipment yep metal would, blade metal blade absolutely yeah yep. yep. Awesome. Yeah. And so the one thing that we haven't mentioned yet that I'll throw in there is that, uh, you know, it doesn't have to be the first thing in your toolkit by no means, but, uh, you know, an avalanche airbag system, right? So I know a lot of us who ride with the airbag systems, um, whether you're pro rider or not, you know, and it that sometimes isn't in people's budget. And I would tell you that if, you know, you've got the basics under control that we've already talked about and you then still have four or five, six hundred dollars left in your budget and that's it go get the training, right? That's the next step is go get a level one training because with that training and that understanding, it's going to help you understand how to use the equipment and mostly how to avoid, the number one thing is how to avoid the dangers, right? The avalanche terrain. And if you're reading the forecast, you've gone through the training, that's your best investment, you know, short of having those immediate tools that are kind of a gimme, right? Those three items we talked about, get the training, right? Level one course, uh, you know, in your area, you look it up. There's a lot of resources there we can have access to. One of those resources is our website, right? So nwac.us. So www.nwac.us is a great resource for training opportunities as well as just Avalanche Center, you know, the web, the forecast and information. But that airbag pack is then a nice to have, right? I think of it as, you know, what I drive a car without an airbag, you know, in the, st in the steering wheel? Well, I would, it's not necessary. I'm just going to be cautious and I'm going to try to avoid the accident in the first place. But you know what, if I'm going through that green light we talked about earlier and I get T-boned and guess what, there's airbags all over the side of my car, the likelihood of me surviving that accident goes up dramatically if I were to get an accident. Obviously you want to avoid that accident in the first place, right? But, uh, you know, the next thing I want to do, and, and Levi, you and I talked about this tonight ahead of the show. I know there's a story that you want to share here that uh, I'm going to tee this up for everybody is, you know, Levi um, has had, you know, a very traumatic experience in his life. You know, at one point you lost your brother to an avalanche. It was years ago at this point. And I know when I watched the Thunderstruck film just the other night, that was highlighted in the film and you talked about it. And I'd like to give you the opportunity if you don't mind. And, you know, we don't have to go too deep into the story, but, you know, take five minutes or whatever you need to kind of talk through your personal experience that you had and why then, you know, Thunderstruck and yourself and everybody is, is such an advocate 
for avalanche education and safety and supporting our forecasts, our avalanche centers like this too. And so if you don't mind, go ahead and I'll turn it over to you, Levi, and kind of kind of give us some background on what happened. Yeah, so uh, it was 2008. Uh, my brother had just got a new snowmobile, really excited to ride it, and uh, got a really, really big uh, storm came through. And uh, he went up and in, in an area that was prone to avalanches, and, uh, you know, he, he didn't read the forecast or anything like that. Uh, and he paid the, the ultimate price and, you know, so, so did we, uh, his family, his friends. But, uh, I mean, from that experience, you know, I have gotten myself educated and I try to help everybody around me get educated, uh, whether you're skiing or snowmobiling or snowshoeing, doesn't matter if you're in the backcountry. You know, there's things that you should know. And uh, getting involved with with Thunderstruck uh, has just allowed me to take it to the next level. I mean, here I am right now talking to you guys. Uh, you know, just just trying to spread spread awareness and and kind of be an advocate in in this avalanche community. Yeah. Thanks for sharing that, Levi. I know uh, it's always a tough situation. You know, I think at this point, you know, most of us who've been in the industry for any period of time have lost somebody we know to an avalanche at this point. I mean, it's one of those things when I moved here in 2012, eight years ago, I didn't know anybody who died in an avalanche. And I now eight years later can think of a half a dozen people that I knew personally across the country. And, you know, part of it's because I do this show and I've gotten to know a lot of pro riders around the country um, and just other folks too. But, uh, you know, and sometimes it's after the fact, like there's an accident that happens and somehow, some way, just through social media, I get pulled into the discussion and become friends. Like I've got a few episodes, if you go back and watch previous episodes that I have on my John Frayn live page, um, there's episodes we've had where we've had folks on the show who've been in the avalanche with their best friend and their best friend has passed away in an avalanche that even they've triggered. Right. And so that's why we go on and, you know, through these stories and information and sharing, it literally can be life or death with one little nugget that you might hear tonight. That's going to trigger you and inspire you to do something different than you've done before. Right. That's the part I really want to kind of have everybody sink in. So clay, I'm going to kind of tee something up to you and then I'm going to check in with Scott here in a minute, but clay, one thing I want to talk about very soon here, unless Scott has something else, we'll go into it for a minute here, but you know, thunderstruck films has been around for, you know, now 19 years, right? It's Thunderstruck 19 is this one here too. And this transition of you being involved the last five years, you've seen kind of this evolution of where it's gone. And as you took over as the owner and, you know, the person who's kind of in control of kind of the storytelling part of Thunderstruck, you put a big, deep focus on avalanche focus and education. So I want to have you talk about that in a minute, but I'm going to check in with Scott here just first quick. So Scott, we've talked about the forecast. We've talked about the Avalanche <laughs> Center. You know, we've, we've hit a bunch of stuff here, but I don't want to move away from that without making sure we've covered all of the critical points that you want to cover tonight around NWAC and the Avalanche Center. So. Well, I think, I mean, there's so much to cover, John. I wish we I know. Could, could we just keep going, rolling this till midnight. But uh, <laughs> yeah, I think maybe... Maybe just to kind of summarize a few things, I think any day that you, you know you want to get out, any day that you want to ride an avalanche train, if you're going to completely stay out of avalanche train, you don't need a whole bunch of gear and specialized training. If you're just going to go ride in a meadow, doesn't really, you know, there's other things you you need to, I guess, know how to ride your sled. <laughs> but, uh, um, you know, the first thing you need to do is get the forecast. So every day you go get the forecast, then you need to get the gear Yep. which is what we were just discussing. Yep. Uh, and that would be, and I just want to make sure that's really clear, John, to everyone. And I actually, one thing before I even go into that is sure. I'd like to, you know, give the snowmobile community uh, kudos, I think, for awesome. for getting the gear. I mean, I, you know, if I go back 10 years or 15 years ago, I think the number of riders that were, were wearing avalanche transceivers was a pretty low number. Yeah. And I think now, while it's, probably nowhere near a hundred percent of riders riding an avalanche train. It is, I mean, the message has gotten out and, you know, from shows like this and from, you know, BCA, who's one of the sponsors of the shows may, you know, has made awesome inroads with the snowmobile community. They make good products and they have a solid, uh, mess messaging program there. And, um, 
so I guess, you know, regarding gear, I think it's awesome that more snowmobilers are wearing the gear. But back to the gear really quick, you know, it's it's an avalanche transceiver, an avalanche probe, and an avalanche shovel. Yep. It's all three of those things. And I, I've said, you know, I kind of go out on a limb, but if you're if you're not bringing all three, just leave the just just get rid of it all. <laughs> it's so true. It's so true. Because if you look at if you look at like in an avalanche rescue, if you have someone who's buried, time is of the essence. And if you remove any one of those three things from the rescuer, yeah. you're pretty you're you're hosed in, yeah. in order to get that person out in you know ten minute window. You know, if you don't have a probe, you could be you could be on the person with your transceiver, so you think, but all of a sudden you're six feet away and you're half you have to you 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 dig an extra thousand pounds of snow, oh. which adds another ten minutes to it. Yeah. So you've got to have all three, and then uh, like kind of like Levi said that he doesn't go out with people that don't have that equipment. Everyone in the group needs it. Peer pressure it doesn't work. Yeah, well, it doesn't work, you know. And we—I've always joked around like it's, you know, it's like, well, if somebody shows up and doesn't have a shovel and a probe, well, I'm just going to give the, you know, I'm going to give them mine because <laughs> it's them that's going to dig me out. So exactly. I think, you know, honestly, it's like, you know, when you're riding with people in avalanche terrain, um, you know, you're relying on them, you know, for for them to yeah. dig you out. Scott, and I wear so, I wear my safety gear for you. You wear your yeah, safety no, gear for me. Yeah, exactly. So if I show up no. with my gear, no, literally, if I show up with my gear, what I'm telling you, Scott or Levi or Clay, is I love you. Like you're my friend. You're my family. You know, I care got about you back. enough, and I've yeah. got your back. And that's what showing up with your avalanche gear means. And if yeah. you show up to the snow park, Scott, without your beacon or your shovel or your probe or any of it. You pretty much just gave me the middle finger. That's what you just did. Yeah. No, I, I agree. I fully yeah. agree. I mean, it's, I mean, you were you were relying. I mean, when you were riding in a high risk environment, you you know, as Levi just shared his story, it's like things happen and people die, and you need, you know, you are relying on one another, and you need all of that equipment, and everyone in the group needs it. And then back to you know a little more on the gear. Like I think you know I, I think. I think it's really smart for snowmobilers to have two shovels. I really do. And yeah. I think we're starting to see more and more snowmobilers doing that, where they have one to dig their sled out and they keep one on their in their backpack or in their uh, in their vest. Yeah. You know, um, and that never comes out except in an avalanche rescue. Yeah. Because if you're having to dig your sled out in avalanche terrain, if it's stuck You've got your your safety shovel out, and a, and a slide hits you. The chances of you retaining that shovel and being able to then use it if you need to is is pretty low. So I think it's pretty smart with the snowmobile group to have two shovels. It's a good call. Uh, at least one dedicated avalanche shovel and then some something to dig the sled out. But anyway, so get the forecast, get the gear, and then the third piece that you have to have is the training. Yeah. Because all that gear, all that stuff, even the forecast – Without proper formal avalanche training, it's hard to make heads or tails of all of that. It's hard to keep a rescue time down. It's hard, hell, it's hard to figure out what to do with the forecast and figure out how to read terrain and how to apply that forecast to my day out riding. So get yeah. the forecast, get the gear, and get the training every day you ride. There's only one thing I'm going to add, Scott. And yeah. it's going to be me being a smart aleck and making a transition ah. here. Are you ready for it? It's yeah. you also need to watch Thunderstruck 19. Well, yeah, baby. Yeah. See, that's, that's the one thing everybody yeah. forgot. We haven't yeah. gotten that taken care of yet. And so Clay, Clay, so Scott, in all seriousness, you know, that, no, no, so that, seriously. I was just, thank I you. Was just, that's, for, that's for every day you ride. I'm not talking the pre-ride, which is the Thunderstruck. <laughs> <laughs> awesome, awesome, awesome. Now, sincerely, Scott, that you just laid it out perfectly. So I thank you for your, your valuable insights and information. Can I just, can I just add one oh, thing please do, that? Levi. Please do. Yeah. Uh, another thing uh, that's become big in the snowmobile culture right now is uh, radios. Oh, so, yeah. You yeah. know, pack Absolutely. radios. That allows people to get spread out further, unfortunately. And uh, I can't remember what the statistic was exactly, but uh, a good portion of the avalanche fatalities happen because people are just not watching or they're alone or they're separated from the group. And so... You need to stick together. Yeah. But it, I mean, it doesn't doesn't matter if you know if your buddy has a shovel and a probe. Yeah. If 
they don't know you got an avalanche. Yeah. So, yeah, it's it's a it's a great point, Levi. Yeah, we refer to that as as um, effectively solo. Yeah. That's yeah. A, yeah. Yeah. And uh, yeah, it's interesting if you think of you know if if you do like a one of, like a visualization exercise and you're like you know on your sled and you're gonna you're gonna center punch an avalanche slope and all <laughs> of a sudden you imagine your partners are not there. You're out there by yourself, totally yeah. alone. Imagine how you how you change how you would approach that slope. Yeah, you would probably be like, oh no, I yeah, I'm gonna ride that another day because I'm out here alone. Yeah. But what's interesting is that snow. I mean, you know, skiers and snowshoers do it too. Um, you know, where you're you you get separated from your group and you're you know you're essentially solo. I mean, you started out your day with all yeah. your safety gear and your your talk, but you know, if you're a half mile away. And then they circle around wondering where you are and they come back and they find a bunch of avalanche debris. Yeah. Well, once again, you know, it, that's, it's not a good thing. So yeah. Levi, that's think, super insightful. So thanks for bringing that up. I really do appreciate it. So, yeah. And it's, you know, it doesn't matter. It could be not even an avalanche, something as simple. I actually had a guest on my show previously yeah. where someone literally pinned themselves under their sled. Thank yeah. God they still had use of their hand in order to reach over and grab their microphone. Otherwise, they literally would have had a, a sled without a tether running upside down on top of them with carbon dioxide or monoxide coming down on them, you know, pinned under there. They could hardly breathe, but they had the radio. But like I said, guess what? All it took is an opportunity for their arm to get pinned where they couldn't grab their radio and they would have sat there and died even outside of an avalanche, right? And so tree wells is another one. Like there's so many things that, you know, by peeling off alone on your own, it's it's so, again, ignorant if you don't really understand what you're up against and uh, what you're going through with the training. So, Well, uh, and, you know, I, I think a radio is an essential gear, right? It absolutely I mean, is. I, mm-hmm. I, I think they're they're essential, like in the need of a rescue, if you need, and like you were, yep. you were talking about, Levi, like your, you know, your Garmin Delorme device to call out. <laughs> Comms are really important. I think we have to be mindful, though, when we're using uh, equipment and it's it's allowing or enabling bad behavior. It's like, oh, well, hell, I got a radio, so I'll ride up a few miles ahead and no big deal. Uh, radios are really helpful. They can help uh, help you manage your risk better. They can also add, let you take on more risk than you might actually think you are doing because you're you're doing some behavior. Um, same with like you know you can argue that well I'm because I'm wearing my shovel beacon probe I'm going to go ahead and punch that slope that I know I shouldn't be doing. So you can extend that same poor behavior to yeah. avalanche safety equipment. So you just it, it just requires us once again to be cognizant of that and paying attention to what what we're doing out there. Nope, absolutely, absolutely. All right, now, now we will make this transition. Okay. Drum roll. Everybody, everybody, give me a drum roll. Drum roll. Thunderstruck 19. I've gotten a chance to watch it now. I watched it a few times, actually, over the weekend here. And uh, it was it was awesome. It was amazing. And I definitely, you called it out in advance. And when I went back and watched it, the focus that you guys put, especially in the tail end of the film there, around, you know, the avalanche safety and education and, you know, having the right equipment with you and, and how you guys approach it that way, too. But, uh, you know, Clay, why don't you you talk to us, you know, again, hopefully I didn't just steal all your thunder, thunderstruck, get it? Literally, is, you know, thunder here with uh, why you put that in, why it was so important, what are the key things you were trying to put into the film? You know, because here's the thing, it's no different than my show here. It's like, you want to make it entertaining so people want to watch it. But you want people to walk away with some kind of a message, right? That they understand that there's things they need to think about, live to ride another day. But just in your words, I'm going to shut up now because I'm, I feel like I'm using all your words for you. <laughs> no, no, <laughs> no, no, thank you. So, yeah, you know, bottom line, I really saw an area in the industry that wanted to know more just about everything. And, you know, just in, in general, the entertainment system has gone less you know, they've gone away from just the music to the highlight reels, you know, playing it and going like that, like the Netflix had been. Yeah. And the industry's really gone towards that that vlog feel, you know, talking, interacting, you know, all that stuff. So what our vision for Thunderstruck was this year, what we really think we did a good job of coming off to consumers was, is, you know, take someone that's never even snowed before and have them watch that movie. And they're going to they're going to understand 
snowmobiling. And then you take these guys that are, you know, avid sledders, experts, whatever, and they have a better understanding of what goes into a Team Thunderstruck ride, what goes into being on the snow with us. And then obviously on the education side of the avalanche side, that's something that anyone, first time rider to someone that's been riding for 50 years can, can take away. So really kind of wanted to hit all avenues of it. And what we really see as, you know, the future is, you know, being able to incorporate that, that avalanche education and, and awareness in, into our film in more than just a way of, you know, we got a quick shot of a guy holding a beacon, you know, that that's great. But we wanted to put a, a feeling into the movie and, you know, with Levi being a part of it and, and some of the other fantastic writers that were able to give personal input. You know, Levi lost someone special to him in an avalanche. Uh, Trannis Bear, he was in an avalanche. Yeah. You know, he, he was on Oprah Winfrey. Um, so that that's all in that movie. And it just, you know, shows the perspective of what it does to the people around you, what it does to yourself. Uh, just a full on understanding. So we really saw a good opportunity with where the industry needed a, a sled film that could reach and hit on the importance of safety, having fun, avalanche, you know, the whole nine yards, you know, we're not there to, to bore you with the avalanche talk, which does happen. I mean, it's, it's exciting stuff, but it can be kind of boring too. So we really wanted to bring it to the people that maybe haven't even turned their eye to, or, you know, turn an eye or an ear to avalanche awareness put that in our movie and wow, this has kind of got our attention. Yeah. And you know, with, with, go ahead, ahead, no, no, you go ahead. Finish your thought. And, and, and with, you know, the, the the climb uh, Alliance that, you know, we formed with them, um, that is a direction that getting some of our major sponsors on board with is, is really exciting because we can all help each other. And we've had a great discussion tonight with the, the gear and this and that, and kind of after you asked me that gear question, I was kind of, you know, running some gears through my head. And the, the, the truth is that the knowledge needs to be on that gear list. You know, yeah. when you said, what, what other gear comes to mind? Yeah. Knowledge is your gear. Yeah. And That's I good call. started thinking and I, and I started thinking real deeply into it. And this is something that I haven't heard before and something I kind of want to put out there it might be controversial, whatever. But I'm going to say it anyways, because I think it really creates a good question or scenario is think of yourself as someone that's never sled before you're you've never even seen snow and and you show up on the snow to the parking lot and you're going to go ride for the first day would you rather have with you a guy that is just as green as you you know you don't even know how to run the machine but you both have all the gear or would you rather have scott with you and no gear personally i would rather have you know it's one or the other no knowledge all the gear or no gear all the knowledge yeah. I would take my chances with no gear and Scott on the snow with me because yeah. the chances of getting, you know, anything can happen. Like you said, we drive our cars with an airbag because they're there for when we need it. Yeah. But if we can, you know, have a better probability of not getting there, Avoidance, I'm going right? to take, yeah, I would, you know, and, that, and I don't want to send the wrong message where gear is not important, but I think, I think knowledge is number one because, you know, not that it doesn't cost time and money to go get the, the, um, the understanding, but that is something that you can do a pretty good job of. You can do probably pretty cheap. So if you can't afford a beacon, you can't afford, you know, the air pack and this $2,000 worth of equipment, you can afford the knowledge yeah. and start there. And, well, think you know, about I, it. I mean, I, we're all riding sleds that even at a bare minimum are worth several thousand dollars, right? A bare minimum on a used junker that we've had out there forever. But if you're spending on new money on a new sled, you're going to spend at least 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17 grand for a new sled nowadays or more in some cases, depending on what you're on. And if you can sit there and look at me in the face and say, oh, I can't afford an avalanche class or I can't afford the right gear or both. Like, I'll tell you, like, yeah, you know, as Levi said earlier, like, I guess we're just not riding together today, you know. Yep. And, and but, I think it goes both. Yeah, yeah. Go ahead, Scott. Well, no, no. I, I think you bring it up a good point. And, you know, it's 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 interesting. Like, um, yeah, if I can just add to yeah, that. Yeah, please because, do. Please do. Because, you know, in, in the U.S., avalanches kill about 25 to 30 people every year. That's just in the U.S. alone. And seriously injuring, per, like permanently injuring or serious, you know, like a broken femur, like critical injuries. It's several times more than that every year. You know, there's probably, gosh, I mean, who knows? A hundred to a couple hundred people are, are pretty severely and maybe permanently injured. Uh, and while they live, they've, they've got, you know, a pretty severe injury, uh, life-altering injury. 
And what's interesting is that um, when we're talking about like training and education, um, I think one of the things that I've seen in the snowmobile community a little too much is an overemphasis on rescue training. Mm-hmm. And, you know, and, and rescue training is important. You're carrying gear. You need to know how to use it. Yep. But what's interesting, avalanches are so powerful and they're really hard to understand. Even, even someone who does it for a living, if you're, if you're in avalanche terrain, it's really hard to say with 100% certainty that this slope is, is okay to be on. And so there's a lot of uncertainty out there. Um, but if I was going to hedge my bet on the training that I was going to get, yeah. I would hedge my bet on the training that teaches me how to use terrain in the yeah, winter. Absolutely. Yep, yep. And versus yep. how to do avalanche rescue. Now, I don't want I'm not saying don't take avalanche rescue. <laughs> True story. But avalanche rescue without the other training, it's kind of like your example Clay. I want to know how the hell not to get caught in an avalanche versus yep. how do I use the shiny equipment that I'm carrying. Because exactly. Because avalanches are powerful and they can really hurt you. And you do not want to find yourself in an avalanche. And yep. so you really need to focus on the training and skills to keep you from getting caught in an avalanche yep. and then doing rescue. But the rescue, right, if you find yourself using your rescue gear, you or your friends made a critical up. mistake. You mm-hmm. messed up and you mm-hmm. probably messed up big time. Mm-hmm. And so really the goal is how the hell not to mess up. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And, and, and that's a great way to put it. You know, I think the, the gear and, you know, the emphasis on rescue kind of go in that same category yep. and, you know, to our viewers, we definitely don't want to send the wrong messages that stuff doesn't matter because it does, but we do want to bring the awareness to the fact that you got to start with not being in that position in the first place. Okay. And it's fun to go hear about rescuing and it's fun to go learn how to use your shiny new gear, like you said, but the bottom line is, don't get in that position in the first place. That is your insurance. You know, that's what happens when the, you know, the crap hits the fan. You don't want to get there. So, you know, back to the example of which one would you rather have, I'm taking knowledge all day, baby, because tools are great, but we all know, and there's a lot of people that are in trades watching this. If you don't know how to use tools, you know, it doesn't matter. John, you, you know, you work for Microsoft. I have no (laughs) idea what I'm doing with a computer. So you can give me all your tools that you use every day to, to, to code for Xbox, but it doesn't do any good if I have those tools if I don't have your knowledge. So it I, goes, you know. I love how, I love how question. Clay I love how Clay just overestimated my knowledge and abilities, but I love I love you anyway. But it's all good. Take it. I know, right? So 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 I so, take so, it, John. I know, I know. Right. So 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 Levi up over in this corner, and I down in this corner over here. Like I want to say, Levi, is it getting a little little hot over there? Because like the heat that Scott and Clay are making on this show tonight is amazing. <laughs> <laughs> awesome awesome all right so now let's get to thunderstruck adventures has anybody ever heard of thunderstruck adventures it may be a something they've heard I about heard of it. you've heard of it levi levi have you heard of it levi's heard of it how about in the comments right now before i explain it to you let me know in the comments have you ever heard of Thunderstruck Adventures? Yes or no is all you got to say. Yes or no. Yes or no. All right, Clay, kick it off, buddy. Let's hear all about Thunderstruck Adventures. What's going on down in Steamboat Springs, Colorado? Colorado. Absolutely. The good old champagne powder steamboat. So trademark for a reason. Hopefully your show doesn't get flagged. I did use a trademark infringement. So if we get flagged, I guess you can blame me. Ah. But <laughs> <laughs> I had to throw it out there and see, see if Big, uh, Big Brother's listening or not, right? Uh, so, I love it. <laughs> but yeah, so no, uh, yeah, Thunderstruck Adventures, that's that's our newest endeavor. You know, we're super passionate and, and excited about that, you know, being able to get people out on the snow with us and, and ride with them. Um, we have a private mountain that is only accessible by us. It's, it's privately owned. We are the only ones with a private lease on it. So it gives customers something different than, you know, a lot of great guys that, that do, you know, what we're doing. But, you know, we're not a national forest. We are on private property, um, which just adds to the exclusive and, and premiumness of, of our service. So a lot of fun there. 
And with that, you know, we've got a lot of opportunities to do things within avalanche awareness, riding skills, photography, all that good stuff. So we are really excited about bringing people into Thunderstruck Adventures as educators to use our compound, the Thunderstruck Adventure compound, use our name as Thunderstruck, um, and the resources that, you know, we've connected with over the years to bring them together to, you know, get Brian Lundstedt and, and guys like that and, and Aerie um, to the compound and let them, you know, kind of run their show um, at, at our place. So we're, like I said, really, really excited about the future of this. Um, kind of got a little bit of everything going, <laughs> really, where, you know, wanting to still emphasize on that avalanche of education, want to get people in that just want to know how to ride better. Um, and, you know, we do feel that even just our normal guest that comes and, and shows up to ride for the day is going to come away with knowledge of something. Even if it's getting their sled, you know, even if it's a better way to get their sled unstuck, at the end of the day, them being more energetic is, is helpful. You know, it all goes into so much when it comes to riding. And if guys are just burnt out and dead because they can't get their sled unstuck, what good are they going to be when someone is in an avalanche and they're just smoked or breaks their leg and they're already just, you know, beating themselves up? So just making people better riders, more efficient on the machine, yeah. teaching them skills. I mean, it, it all goes into, you know, kind of a one shot, you know, one, one, one shot fits all. So, you know, obviously looking to enhance their education on safety and, and avalanche awareness, but not necessarily doing a full on, you know, Abby one or two course every day with each client. Yeah. Um, you know, we're not spending two or three hours talking avalanche with them that day because maybe it's just going in one year and out the other. But when we do see an opportunity that we can help that person have a better understanding, make them more efficient on their sled, point out terrain that's safe, point out terrain that's not safe, just little things here and there, you know, that's the value that we think we can add just to your average everyday rider without doing the, the full on course, uh, without getting them fully in, engaged yeah. in, you know, an avalanche one course or, you know, classroom stuff, just the little stuff that we can do here and there. We think we have a lot of value in, in helping people with. Yeah, no, absolutely. And I'll just, you know, from my own personal experience and kind of knowing my own journey of, you know, how I can handle my snowmobile, you know, the, the skills that I've gained over time, I think back to, you know, this topic of backcountry safety and, you know, avalanche, mm -hmm. avalanche is included, but maybe a little different than that in, in this moment is the idea that I think back to the times that I have gotten hurt or I've had to tow a snowmobile out of the backcountry, or, you know, we've had to part, you know, when things go wrong in a big way, I actually can look back at that and honestly say it was because of my lack of riding skills at that time, right? I smoked a tree one time. I was up on a hill, quote unquote, high marking at the time, started coming downhill, and it was before I had learned how to get my sled on edge and side hill. And I was like bonsai and straight down to some trees. I bailed. It was in Cook City, Montana. I bailed took off my sled started cartwheeling down the hill it rolled a few times then it t-boned a tree at the bottom of the hill luckily i could still ride it out that day but uh guess what it was a brand new <laughs> skidoo free ride a 2011 skidoo free ride that now had a mashed up front end it you know cost me a twisted up ankle when i hit the trees like i actually sprained my ankle pretty bad it took me a month or two to kind of heal it from that you know there's a lot of things and it, it goes back to that idea of like if i can control my sled i now can probably better navigate my way through backcountry terrain and avalanche terrain to avoid areas because you know somebody who's a non-skilled rider might look at a, a slope and say okay i got to get up over the top the only way i can get there is straight up over the chute because i know my machine will make it for horsepower wise but they might be shooting straight up an avalanche chute because it's clear there's no trees there not realizing what they're up against where a skilled rider who can ride the trees might find a ridge off to the side that's up on a you know a ridge where there's no avalanche terrain because if you're on top of this ridge and you're following the ridge up Guess what? If you're on top of it, the likelihood of you being in an avalanche is a lot lower than going right up the face of an avalanche chute, right? So, exactly, yeah. And yeah. We, you know, like I said, we want to bring in the pros. We want to bring in the guys that you know are taking it as far as it's going in the industry. We're we're welcoming that. But I also see a vision where we can make it a little bit more practical. You know, my first you know avalanche class that I sat in. Um, I was probably 14, 15 years old. I was just like a lot of people out there watching, just extremely passionate about snowmobiling. I mean, I just lived, breathed, just that, that was my life with snowmobiling. Yeah. Um, and I was applying myself in this class and I was pretty disappointed coming out of that class. Um, you know, it was a class that made you feel like you shouldn't even be riding. 
Yeah. And I get that wanting to scare, you know, it's like going through driver's ed or whatever. You want to scare the people so that they're, you know, thinking about it. But, you know, the instructor, yeah, we, we cut a slab in the snow and, you know, we're not going over this. And he showed a picture of it. And it's something that we'd ride every day. Like, we're not going over that about cutting a slab. And, you know, this took us three hours before we felt safe going over this hill. Yeah. And it's like, that's great to talk about. But I'm a Midwest guy. I grew up in Minnesota. I rode, you know, I was in high school, you know, I, I rode six days a year if I was lucky. And what we want to give to our customers is something that's practical to not scare them away. Because for years, that left a bad taste in my mouth. I was, I was pretty scared away from avalanche education and awareness because it's like, they're just, they're so hardcore. They're not realistic. You know, I'm a Midwest guy. Yeah. If it's red, a lot of these Midwest guys, they're going to go ride. They don't care what you tell them. And you know what? They're, they're willing to take the risk and they're okay with that. Um, a lot of people have different risk values and if they're okay with that, so be it, you know, don't, you know, I'd probably put, I'd probably put that back in the, the category of ignorance, right? They just don't know what they're exactly. up against really. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So instead of steering those guys away, they're just going to go do it anyways. Um, and just ignore it. You know, our goal is to, people are going to ride regardless. They only get so many days in, they're going to make the decision, but can we help them make better decisions within that day? Yeah. You know, the decisions they made to ride, I don't write them off and say, you idiots, you know, what are you doing riding on a black day? I say, well, you made that decision. That's your decision to make. (laughs) Is there a way that, you know, something that I could have done that was going to help you on that day to to at least ride safer. And, you know, that, that, that's kind of where we, we want to make it more practical, because, yeah. you know, I, it, it's hard for, you know, a Midwest guy, which is a large majority of people that ride out West, yeah. larger than the people that live out West, to, to dig a pit, to, to do this, to do that. And it's all great. We love it. And like I said, we want that more and more involved. But at the same time, we want to make it practical where people are actually taking something away, not feeling overwhelmed, not feeling like it's too much for them to comprehend and they should just not do it at all. We want to give them something so at least yeah. they get started. And then just build on that versus you throw the whole kitchen sink at them. Yeah. They don't know what they're listening to. They, you know, they, they come out of the <laughs> four hour, you know, class and they're like, well, that was great. I'm, I'm scared for my life. I think I'm just going to sell everything and go jet ski now. <laughs> you know? Very nice. Awesome. Awesome. So thank you for, for that. And uh, just as a reminder, if anybody wants to find uh, Thunderstruck Adventures in the show notes, in the, the main body of the show notes, you'll find a link in there to Thunderstruck Adventures. Um, you'll find a film, the film links and stuff too, to be able to get access to that. You'll find Avalanche Center NWAC's website in there, as well as, don't forget, the sled bash raffle we've got all those amazing prizes in there there's uh you know for sharing the show out every share that you make you're going to get a uh opportunity at winning one of six different you know not different but six dvds like you know one person can win one um but we'll go through and we'll give away six different uh dvds is just for the share and win i'll manage that one on my side because i can see that um but lots lots of stuff going on and so what i want to do now is just kind of wind this up here i'm going to give everybody on the show here a quick opportunity to kind of give some final comments i'm going to start with you levi shift you clay scott and then i'll wrap it up at the end so levi final thoughts Uh, i'd say you know understand the best that you can, uh, what the terrain, what the terrain's like and get the gear, get the knowledge. Uh, it's, it's cheap when you're talking about price as far as the price that I paid. And so, and, and, you know, many, many other families and people have have paid. So, uh, yeah, I'd say get the gear, get the knowledge. Have some fun while you're at it. But I appreciate you being on here, Levi. I really do. Thanks for coming on tonight. Clay, final thoughts, final thoughts, final words. Yeah, I I echo Levi. Get the gear, get the knowledge. Um, So important. Don't feel overwhelmed by the amount of gear that, you know, your and your shopping cart online. Don't get overwhelmed by the amount of knowledge that you need. Um, Start simple and, and just build from there. You know, do what's within your ability for time on the knowledge and finances on the gear. And just, you know, work at wanting to be wiser, wanting to ride smarter, um, because your actions are going to affect others, not just yourself. So keep that in mind and be, be excited to learn, be excited to get the gear and know that there's resources out there, such as all the gentlemen on this call that are, you know, willing to help you in any way we can um, on the gear and knowledge side. Thank you so much, Clay. I appreciate it. Scott, final thoughts. 
Oh, I got a lot. Oh, uh, no, 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 that's it. It's, Done. Yeah. Done. No, Scott, you're cut off. Mute, uh, mute, mute. No, just kidding. Go, <laughs> go no, ahead. No, I mean, it's been, it's been great conversation. I mean, first, I guess I'd like to thank you, John, for organizing and, and Clay and Levi. It's been great to hang out with you. And and I think, you know, thanks to all your viewers who are sitting uh, here listening to this and thinking about getting educated and uh, staying connected to the community. Um, you know, which I, I'll mention, you know, I mean, NWAC, like most avalanche centers, you know, we're a community supported avalanche center. Uh, we serve you all. So we, you know, our goal is to equip you with knowledge to go and have a good day out in the mountains and to come back. And so, you know, we rely on, you know, help us help you. So, you know, if you can, we'd, we'd love, uh, you know, to become a member. Um, we also have this great um, raffle uh, yeah. auction thing that I think John's mentioned is in the notes. So, you know, I guess I'd also like to thank really quick, you know, obviously Thunderstruck Films for throwing in some films. Uh, Mountain Lab, uh, Cal Topo, Truck Boss, uh, BCA, and Ordovox for throwing in some awesome avalanche safety equipment. Um, and then if I can, John, just have for one second, one, I just, one, I, I need to one thank, second, <laughs> I, I have to, I have to thank our, our number one sponsor, which is Clem's Enumclaw Power Sports. And so this is this awesome shop in Enumclaw, Washington. I mean, hell, I don't know how long they've been around. I think since like 1974 or something like that. I remember that and, number because that was the year I was born. So I remember yeah. that's exactly it. You yeah, got so it. You nailed it. They've been around as long as John Ferry. I know. Look at, all gr look at how gray I am, right? Like that's how long they've been around. <laughs> so they're as, gr yeah, they're as gray as John Ferry. And, and, um, you but, know, as cool, still, but as cool as Clay and Levi, let's be clear. <laughs> yeah, but they're still cool, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, Clems is our number one partner, and you know, one of one of our challenges at at NWAC for for many years, um, and we're almost as old. We were started in 1977. Okay. Uh, you know, we didn't have snowmobiles, and we didn't have number one, we couldn't afford them. Number two, we didn't know how to use them, and so forth. And uh, you know, we've been knowing that we needed sleds to access the mountains so that we could build an a better avalanche forecast and connect with the snowmobile community. And, you know, uh, last year, Clem stepped up and they 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 organized a partnership with uh, Polaris and those guys got us six snowmobiles. And so six of our forecasters last year were given a brand new sled on lease from Clem's. And, uh, you know, and, and we, we sent them back to, to those guys. Um, I think it was back in the spring and then they stepped up again and they got us six more sleds this year. So another, uh, yeah, no, it's amazing. And, uh, so, I mean, these guys just, they, they get it and, uh, they're in, they're in huge support of the avalanche center. So when you're out riding in, in Washington, Northern Oregon, you know, you should thank Clems because those guys are powering this avalanche center. And so it's awesome. And so thanks, Clem. Uh, thanks, Jeff, Darren and Corey uh, for making that happen. And we really appreciate the support. And uh, and if you're ever out near Enumclaw, stop in because these guys are great. Um I, I, so, I'm glad I gave you more than one second. So that was yeah. an amazing that was an amazing announcement. And just to be clear, Clems is my dealer of choice as well, too. That's where I buy all of my sleds, including my new Durbo I just picked up a few weeks ago. So nice. Scott, <laughs> Scott, finish up your thoughts, and then I'll come in and wrap it up. So and then you'll come in and wrap up just 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 the Turbo piece, huh? Exactly. <laughs> No, I mean, th these guys have been awesome. So I, I just I can't I can't say enough um, about the appreciation that we have at, at NWAC for Clems and basically allowing us to build the forecast that we do. So thanks, guys. Um, and then, yeah, I think in close, I think, you know, ultimately, I just want all of you out there that's riding an avalanche terrain to just make it a habit to, you know, get the forecast, make sure you're riding with the right gear and then go out and get avalanche training this year. And if you're doing those three things, and if everyone in your group is doing those three things, um, I think there's a good chance you're going to have a kick-ass day and come back to tell all of us about it. Um, so, yeah, here's to safe season. Nope, absolutely. I, I don't know if, uh, if NWAC has a feature like this, but uh, the Utah Avalanche Center has a tab where you can add 
uh, observations. And so yep. I found that, uh, you know, when you're, when you take time to stop and look at an avalanche and everything that's, you know, surrounding it, uh, you're more likely to stay away from that type of stuff. So I should, that, that's just one last thing I wanted to add. Yeah, to no, that's, thing. that's, well, I mean, Levi, I couldn't have said that better. I mean, that is like, I mean, you teed that up perfect. I mean, yes, we have an observations tab on our site. I'm, I'm pretty sure about every avalanche center does. Um, and, you know, that also really a simple and it, you don't have to be a snow professional yeah. to give us an observation. And in fact, probably one of the most important things is if you saw an avalanche, if you were involved in an avalanche, just take a picture tell us when it happened and send it to us in that observations link. And that is so important for us to be able to put the forecast together. So the more of that that we can get out of you, the better. And even if you went out and had a great day of riding and you could just you know, write a couple of sentences about what the snow felt like and looked like, that also helps us out too. So you don't, don't think that you need to be a, a snow professional and speak in the in the you know snow science languages to be able to give us a good observation. A photo and just kind of what you felt and saw uh, goes a long ways. And so yeah, please um, get engaged and give us observations. Awesome, you guys. I'm I'm humbled to be in the presence of so much awesomeness. This has been an amazing <laughs> episode tonight. Um, you know, for anybody who maybe is seeing this show for the first time because they're interested in seeing the Northwest Avalanche Center or they follow Thunderstruck Films, just know that every single Sunday night, and sometimes more frequently, but pretty much every Sunday night, year-round, for the last two and a half years, I've been doing a live episode every Sunday night, 7 p.m. Pacific time, right here on my personal page where you found this, John Farian. Just so you know, all the shows are cataloged over on John Farian Live. You just put it in the search engine on Facebook, John Ferian Live, and you'll find all kinds of incredible content, uh, fun things on products, but with a heavy focus on this kind of topic. So avalanche safety and education, backcountry safety, you know, people who are really doing great things in the sport, and we got a lot of more episodes coming. So um, please feel free to check back anytime. We'd love to have you back and have you in the in the fan base and love to see all the names in the comments. So what I tell everybody at the end of the night is live large, guys. It's live life to the fullest, make the most of every day, and make a difference to others just like these three did tonight so have a great night everybody thanks everyone bye thanks john thank you everyone for being around, around.